This is Peter. And this is Tom. And you're listening to History Teachers Talking Podcasts. All right, this is Peter Sablaki and Thomas Reska, and welcome back to our podcast. All right, Tommy, what do we got? Well, today, in honor of um, the recent Martin Luther King Day, we're going to be looking at the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., which I believe we did touch on a little bit back in our 1968 episode, right? We did. We did. Yeah, yeah we did this briefly is just, talk about it. This is just a little bit more of a examination of it, what brings them to Memphis, the assassination, the, the manhunt, right, for James yep. Ray. And then a little bit of some things that's happened about uh, somewhat recently involving the King family and the assassination, where they stand on it and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're not conspiracy theorists by any means, but we are going to mention some of the conspiracy theories. And because, like you said, this is something that's still ongoing. And you just mentioned there's a new podcast that came out about this, right? Yeah, I believe it's called the um, I haven't listened to it yet, but I heard about it on the drive home today called the MLK Tapes. And they discuss. Um, about the again with the manhunt for Ray, and then just basically the idea that he was not the lone gunman or he wasn't even the one involved in the shooting at all. So there's a lot of different theories out there, and it, I think believe that podcast really does a, a deep, deep, deep dive into all that. We're not doing that much again. This is just kind of just a little facts. bit of information on it. We're just talking about some facts and yeah. taking it from there. Just having a conversation, but I feel yeah. like. It's really interesting because similar thing that happened with Oswald, right, and Kennedy and James Earl Ray, it's this idea of like, it's almost impossible that one single person that is so much beneath the person that they are slaying, in a sense, right, that they're killing, could do such a thing. You know what I mean? It's this idea of like, how can Oswald kill the JFK? How can just this this nobody, yeah. James Earl Ray, kill the MLK? And and I think that's what also sparks this idea of like, that's impossible. Like a nobody like that cannot kill somebody like MLK or somebody like JFK. And I think that is the reason why there is a lot of different conspiracy theorists that go along with these you know, high profile murders, because you can't believe that something like that yeah. would happen. And it was an earth earth shaking event. Like, like we talked about 1968 had a whole bunch of its own problems, yeah. but it was, um, you know, you had the civil rights movement going on, you had Vietnam War, anti-war movement was in full swing. Uh, King was against the Vietnam War. He was building a um, steadily since like '65. He's talking about that. And there's um, a coalition, which we'll get to today. I think yeah. we'll, you know, we'll talk about the coalition of, of poverty and stuff. And but also, it's one of, of '60s overall has four big high-profile murders. Right? Um, you have JFK starts it with '63, '65 you have Malcolm X, and then '68 you have MLK and RFK. So this yeah. is usually kind of brought together in this yeah. lump of four big murders of 19 yeah, mlk is in april and then and then rfk is in june yep so let's uh let's let's kind of talk about this right let's figure out what what he's doing in memphis why he's there um some of the significance of it and then what ultimately happens first of all king uh, based on just researching this you guys will come to realize that uh mlk was actually um it, you know, he had many death threats. You know, there's a lot of people oh, because yeah. he, he was very popular in the civil rights movement. Um, and he believed himself that that with that came a huge risk of death. And it nearly happened in the 50s. Right. Well, he was stabbed. In the yeah, 50s. It, was, it was 58. It was an African-American woman that actually stabbed him um, with a letter opener. Right. It was like a Harlem book signing in 58. And um, she she stabbed him and apparently it was so close that. Later on, he talks about this in his speech that if he had done as much as sneezed or moved a little bit, um, it would have severed his artery and he would have died. Um, so he does survive one um, assassination. He survived that. And I know after um, Kennedy's assassination in 63, he supposedly tells his wife, Coletta, um, Coretta, excuse me, that um, this is what's going to happen to me also. So I keep telling you this. He says, this is a sick society. So he was kind of like aware of this. He was kind of like, knew that you know there's a very good chance because you know, there's public life and there are these more or less crazies out there that were you know going to come after him just like they just did kennedy yep so memphis memphis tennessee essentially the, the main reason why he travels to memphis this is remember this is 1968 the civil rights movement technically peaked in 64 and 65 with the passage of the civil rights act of 64 followed by the march to selma 
and the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 65. And really not much else happened when it comes to legislation for civil rights legislation since then. Now, King started to shift a little bit because King's initial goal was in civil rights was to end segregation. And segregation, at least on paper, um, you know, ended in 64, 65. What he's looking at here is now looking at the injustice and the inequality between the races, uh, specifically poverty. And while he mostly concentrated on ending segregation in the South, he starts to shift his viewpoint and really concentrate on the North. The North doesn't have you know, what is known as the jury segregation by law. It has de facto segregation, which is based more off of um, like socioeconomic issues where you had yeah. blacks lived in essentially ghettos in cities, inner cities, where there was not a lot of funding for them. Which yeah, it wasn't policy, but it still it still happened. It still took place. Exactly. Well, he's in Manhattan, Tennessee, but he's um, in support of striking African-American sanitation workers. Yep. They basically they've been have they staged a walkout in February of '68. They were there to protest unequal wages, working conditions. Uh, that was all put in place by the mayor, a man named Henry Loeb. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, at the time, the African American workers were paid lower wages than the white workers. Yep. Um, they also weren't issued um, any city uniforms. They weren't allowed to use the uh, the restrooms there. They had no recognized union. They had no grievance to go and like basically report this procedure when they were underpaid or not paid. Yep. And um, basically things didn't get any better. And then uh, apparently in February of 68, two of them died in a garbage, yeah. uh, garbage truck um, accident. And that led to the strike. Yeah. Apparently it was, um, it was like a rainstorm, a rainstorm rather. And you had these two workers that like were looking for a refuge from the rainstorm. So they actually jumped into the compactor area of the garbage truck and somehow the garbage truck, like the compact area, turned itself on and they were crushed. And that is kind of what led to the ultimate strike. Like enough is enough. African-Americans are not treated equally in the sanitation aspect. So he goes to Memphis on March 28th, 1968 to participate in this in this march. Um, and the march actually ends in violence. So it never really comes to fruition. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. He doesn't finish the march. So he returns to Memphis on the third, I think. Um, yeah, because his, oh, his airline, I believe his flight was delayed because of a bomb threat. Yep. Because he was going to go and give a um, speech. And um, he gives a he speech did, at he, the Mason Temple, yeah, which is a very Mason Temple, speech. yeah. Yeah, the Church of God in Christ. Yeah, the world headquarters of Church of God in Christ. So he gives his uh, famous I've been to the mountaintop speech. Yep. He talks about his, it's kind of uh, also very foreboding, I guess, because he, yep. he, he, he talks about his 1958 attempted assassination. Yeah. Um, he like drives the point home. Like he, he's time. talking about it. Yeah. He talks about it. And um, he even references a letter by a young girl who told him that she was happy that he had not uh, sneezed like you're talking about, because, yeah. you know, if they said if he sneezed, he was going to die. And he yeah. talks about, I too, I'm, I, I too am happy that I did not sneeze. And then he talks about, you know, what he, what he's done. And, you know, uh, from that point. So he's, he's, it's kind of like a very interesting because then what happens just, you know, well, yeah, a little the next day, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, the next day. So also what the, the idea of, you know, I've been to the mountaintop. It's interesting because he finishes the speech and that's what people always like say. It's like a prophecy almost because he finishes the speech by mentioning his like bomb threats. And he talks about the bomb threat that ultimately delayed him getting to Memphis where he talks about too, he's not a fearing man, right? Yeah. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. So he's almost like saying, like, like he says, his wife, he was kind of not that he knew it was going to happen that day, but he was kind of expecting there was going to be other attempts at yeah. his life, you know, and that maybe one of these future attempts, yeah, one of these future attempts could uh, be successful. Yep. I, yeah, he's I, young. He was young, 39 years old. Although I don't know if you saw that, but after they did an autopsy, they said that his heart, because they actually opened up his chest to try to literally resuscitate him by like massaging his heart. And they said his heart was of like a 60-year-old man based on all the stress he's been through. Stress and stuff like that. Yep. I did read somewhere too. They said probably if he was shot, if it happened today, they probably would have been able to save him. Nuts. That's been one of those things. So like how medical has, has it, how it advanced. Because well, he was they still breathing. Save he was breathing yeah, he was still breathing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, they believe they probably, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's do this. So basically what happens here is he gives a speech, and in this speech he basically says that, like, you know, what will happen 
to me from some of our sick white brothers. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind like anybody. I would like to have a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I mean, he literally kind of says like, hey, you know what? If if I die, you know, I'm, I'm going to die. It's it's intense speech. And first of all, you could hear this speech. Actually, you could watch it on YouTube or at least listen to it on YouTube. And MLK was an amazing speaker. I mean, if you hear that voice, oh, yeah. it is just something else. Every time I hear it, specifically in his speech, it's like I get goosebumps. It, it's nuts. So on Thursday, April 4th, so the next day, um, you were staying in room 304. No, it's wrong. 306, right? Lorraine Motel in Memphis, yeah. which yep. today is actually the National Civil Rights Museum. Um, for those of you guys listening, and if you're in the area, I'm sure you've probably been. He's there with some colleagues and friends, including, uh, what's his name was with him? Uh, Reverend Jesse Je- Jackson. Je- Jesse Jackson, yeah. And apparently as they're walking on this balcony, he actually asks the, one of the people that is with him, a, a musician, and he was the musician was scheduled to perform something that evening. And he says, Ben, make sure you play Take My Hand, Precious Lord, in a meeting tonight. You know, it's like, I really like that song. Played real pretty. Like that is supposedly the last thing that he says. And at that point, what happens is a bullet basically is fired at King um, from 6.01 p.m. The bullet strikes him in the face. It actually goes in his right cheek, right? Um, From what I read, it goes through his right cheek. It breaks his jaw, um, several of his vertebrates, um, and then travels down through uh, his spinal cord. And goes into his shoulder, lodges in his shoulder. Um, he essentially, they said his shot was so powerful, it ripped through his, um, ripped his necktie off. So he falls back in a balcony unconscious. Shortly after the shot is fired, later on witnesses say that they believe they saw a man who is later identified as James Earl Ray fleeing from a rooming house right across the street from the Lorraine Motel. And apparently Ray had been renting a room in this boarding house. And then eventually the police find um, the package dumped close to the site. And that package included a rifle and binoculars, and they both had raised fingerprints on it. Um, so we'll get to that a little bit more. But King it himself is rushed to hospital because he was still alive. He, still he was pulse. still alive. They still had a pulse, right? And that's when um, they try to the whole, you know, they literally open up his chest. They're trying to yeah. resurrect cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Yep, nuts. Um, he is pronounced dead at seven o five. Um, yeah, which is uh, 39. I can't get over that. Um, yeah, so I guess now we can say that. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, you go first. I was going to say after his assassination. So, you know, he was assassinated. So we know that, um, we started getting, you know, King's widow, um, had, was notified, had informed the children that their father was dead. She received a large number of telegrams, right? This um, was a weird one. Do you see this one? Yeah, actually yeah, from Lee Harvey Oswald, um, mother actually yeah. sent sent one just kind of saying you know listen I'm just, like, that, we don't really um, know actually it, what it says it, i don't it, think it but just i guess just like a, um she um coretta king just kind of says listen that one really like you know touched her the most because you know she's this other one that happened just a f- you know a few years prior yeah um talking about it um a lot of people from the movement started doing it um robert f kennedy gave his speech talking oh, that, about we should it talk about that because that's a kind of a that, yeah, that yeah, is considered yeah, actually one of the considered, widely considered, one of the greatest speeches in American history, you know, RFK speech and assassination. And that same night, RFK, who is essentially on a, on a campaign trail, right, he's running for president, learns about the shooting while he's traveling to Indianapolis. And he was scheduled to make a speech there in a predominantly black neighborhood. Um, and he learns about King's death right before not death, but like he was, that King was hurt. That shot, As he yeah. takes off. Yep. When he lands, he finds out the King is, uh, has passed. And the press secretary is like, all right, we have some, you know, this is, we can't guarantee your safety. I, I don't know if you should mention anything. Um, you know, this is mostly an African-American crowd. And, and if anything, you should read this speech. And they like prepared a speech for him. And he was like, no, no, I'm going to, I'm going to do my own speech. And essentially most of the world found out, um, through that speech that that king had died yeah a lot of the people there didn't even know until he no idea yeah he told them flat out um so he basically stood on the back of his flatbed truck uh the speech was four minutes and 57 seconds and uh he was the first to tell the audience which was recorded as well as and sent to different news networks um that king had died and 
in it, essentially, he acknowledged that there will be anger. And he said, for those of you who are black and are tempted to be filled with hatred and mistrust of the injustice of such an act against all white people, I would only say that I can only feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. And this is the first time he publicly talks about the death of his brother. He says, I had a member of my family killed, but he was killed by a white man. And then he kind of goes through this idea that we need to make an effort to go beyond these rather difficult times and this idea that we should come together. And they say that that speech was probably what led Indianapolis yeah. to not, not have, to have the, the same riots. riots. Not have the riots, because he had riots in a lot of other major cities. Yep. And we'll talk about that. He had um, you know, riots all, all over the country. Yeah, not in Memphis. They're crediting that with um, Kennedy. He also then cancels the rest of his um, scheduled campaign appearances in his hotel room. Yep. He does put out some other press releases. Yeah, the um, next day. They're, stuff. Yeah, they're, they're significant, but they're not, they don't have as much historical attention as the speech he did in Indianapolis. Yep, 100%. Um, Lyndon B. Johnson is also aware of this. He's, he's uh, that evening he was planning on meeting in Hawaii with Vietnam, with Vietnam War military commanders. And, and then that's when the press secretary tells him what had happened. He actually calls uh, Coretta Scott King. He declares April 7th a national day of mourning. So you yep. start off in that, but you also have riots popping up in other parts of the country. They're saying this is not what, you know, um, Dr. Martin Luther King would have wanted, but also people are angry. People are upset. And so, you know, rioting is something that tends to happen with that. The other thing I find interesting is that LBJ does not attend his funeral. That I, yes. I, I didn't know that until like started doing research for this. But you have all these riots and, and the riots are this is you know, this is pretty intense. The destruction, especially Washington, D.C. riots, they were all over the place. And there was a massive fear of just like insurrection. On April 8th, before the funeral, Coretta Scott King and her four young children actually led the walk or march for the sanitation workers that her, her husband was supposed to lead. An estimated 40,000 marched in silence through the streets of Memphis to honor King support the cause of city's black sanitation workers by the way the city they had, yeah they did i was gonna say yeah they settled pretty quickly after right that, away they knew that, yeah. that it was gonna not gonna end well for them so they settled very quickly with very favorable terms for the center for the sanitation workers yep uh and then the next day you have funeral rites are held at king's hometown atlanta georgia ultimately i think there was a massive outpouring of support for king a lot of it also came from People that were traditionally, you know, some politicians that were traditionally like sectionalist in a sense, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that definitely brought some people together that normally would not have happened. Now, the funeral itself, you know, you're looking at a crowd of about 300,000 attended King's funeral on April 9th. Uh, and as I mentioned before, Vice President H Herbert Humphrey attends on behalf of Johnson because apparently Johnson is... I mean, not apparently, this is 68. Vietnam is at its peak, as we mentioned in our 68 podcast. It seems like the world is falling apart. So he's actually at a meeting for a Vietnam War, and there was fears that if he attended the funeral, it might have skewed the funeral because protester might, protesters might have showed up to kind of protest the Vietnam War, and they felt like that would be distasteful and actually ruin the funeral. You know, he decides to stay um, home for that one. Well, not home. He's at Camp David. Before we get into theories, let's talk about the guy that's caught, how he's caught, and then we'll talk about some of the theories, why potentially maybe he wasn't the only one and why potentially MLK was actually shot. Or at yeah, least the yeah, so it makes sense. So James O'Reilly, I guess we're not getting too much into him, right? But yeah, he I mean, was based... Go ahead. He was, um, he was a convict. He was a criminal. He was a career criminal. Yeah, he was a career convict. You know, a lot of burglary, burglary um, served years for uh, two years for armed robbery, um, mail fraud, things of that nature, caught stealing money, armed robbery, again, at liquor stores. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison for these repeated offenses. He escapes the Missouri State Penitentiary in 1967 by riding in a um, truck transport, um, like a bread delivery truck. Mm -hmm. So he's able to uh, escape that way. Following his escape, he stayed... Um, moving throughout the United States. He went to Canada for a little bit, comes back in St. Louis, Chicago, right? He's all over the place, basically. And I got this vibe too, like based on reading this, that he was like not the brightest bulb. They said yeah. that he actually was, he joined U.S. Army in World War II and served in Germany, but he was discharged for ineptitude and like a lack of, you know, capabilities and abilities. Like he was just not a bright bulb, which is why some of these conspiracy theories come out. Like there's no way that this person, this nobody, you know what I mean? Like could do this because if you look at his background i mean he 
There's nothing special about this dude by any means. Yeah, no. All right, so let's get Bergers closer to 68. What do you have? Well, earlier 68, he actually did get um, facial reconstruction surgery. I saw he, got that. Rhinopl- he got rhinoplasty, which I was kind of odd, but for whatever reason he did. Um, and then he arrives in Atlanta in March of 1968. Yeah. He checks into a rooming house, right? He brought a map of the city. FBI agents later find this map when they search the room. And on the map, there were locations of basically churches and residents that Martin Luther King visited that were circled. So he was it was proof that he was playing this. He did have some, obviously, role in this and everything. Then he, he um, drove to Alabama and he bought the he Remington Alabama, model. Yeah. That's, that's when he got the, yeah. That's when he bought the rifle with the uh, 20 boxes of ammunition. Yep. He bought the scope, which he used to mount the rifle. And he told shopkeepers he was going on a hunting trip with his brother. And there's proof of all this. Like, we know for a yeah. fact this guy did this stuff, which, yeah. again, kind of adds to, like, you know, people are like, no, he didn't do this. Uh, well, some of the evidence, you know, like, it, it happened. People saw him do this. Yeah, he bought um, the rifle. And that was the rifle that was used. Like, that's what, that stuff did happen. Yeah. Yep. Uh, he had, like, an alias, too, right? Like, in Mexico? Um, like- H- Harvey Lohmeyer. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, no, yeah, that that was it. You're right. So after he purchases oh, yeah. all that stuff, he basically drives back to Atlanta, and they say that he kind of just sits there and basically he starts to, based on reading newspapers, plot King's movements, which is how he figures out the whole Memphis, Tennessee part um, is scheduled for April first, and on April second, he basically packs his bag and drives to Memphis. Like he is very ready for this. So, as far as, you know, the story goes here, on April 4th, 1964, he kills MLK. That's the official story as yeah, far as the United that, States yeah. government's concerned. He did it with a single shot fired from this Remington rifle. He was standing on a second floor balcony. I'm sorry, King was standing on a second floor balcony, right? Uh, and and Ray was a, on a rooming house across the street when he shoots him. At that point... That's the basically packet, when he, he, he starts running, right? Witnesses, yeah, and that's how they figured out it's him because he needs running, fingerprints. He, yeah. Yeah, well, he left a package, yeah, that had, like, the rifle, the binoculars on it, and they were found with his fingerprints. Yep. Um, but Ray himself, he leaves for Atlanta in his Ford Mustang. He drives 11 hours, picks up his belongings. He goes to Canada. Then Toronto, then he actually takes a um, – he attained a Canadian passport under a false This name. is fishy because based on this guy, like, he's a dumb butt. You know, like, how is he getting this false identification? This and Again, I'm trying to play devil's advocate here, but, you know, he gets a Canadian passport. Yeah, yeah. As a Ramon, Ramon, Ramon George Sniat or Sniat or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And he leaves, he goes to England, right? Yeah. Then Lisbon, Portugal. Then he returns to England. Like it takes a couple He's of months to place. find yeah. him. It takes I think, two months to find him. And yeah. he was planning on leaving London and going to Brussels, I believe. Mm-hmm. And that's, or part, or maybe even, believe it or not, um, South Africa, apartheid South Africa at the time, using this falsified Canadian passport. And then, I did check in the ticket agent noticed the name on his passport. And that name was actually on a Royal Canadian Mounted Police watch list. Mm-hmm. So at the airport, if it just noted that he was uh, carrying a, another passport with another name, they're like, okay, this doesn't make much sense. And then they quickly, um, the UK quickly extradited him to Tennessee where he was charged with King's murder. Because of the fact that this package he dropped right outside the place from which he was shooting with all his fingerprints on it, this is why people are like, why would he do that? You know what I mean? Because we knew his name. I mean, there was wanted posters of him. For the two months that he was running under different aliases, we were searching for, for James Earl Wright. Like, we we said, this is the guy that killed King. So he gets he gets arrested, he, and he essentially enters a guilty plea. And, you know, his his attorney apparently says, listen, if you enter a guilty plea, you're not going to get a death sentence, right? Or you're not going to be electrocuted. So he's like, all right, fine. Yes, I, I did it. At that point, my understanding is three days, right? I think it takes about three then days. He rec- then he recants. Yeah. He yeah. says, no, I he's didn't He's like, uh, wait, you know what? I didn't do that. First of all, he gets 99 years in prison. And he's like, you know what? Three days later, he's like, I didn't actually kill him. He goes, really? It was, um, he, first of all, he fires his attorney, right? And he gets somebody else. And then he says, I wasn't even there when this happened. And it was somebody else that did it. And I think he even throws his brother under the bus and says his brother had something to do with it. I answered that one. I know he he was reason he later says the reason why he left the package there with the binoculars and the gun was because he wanted to become a famous criminal. He was also delusional too. He believed that um George Wallace, governor of Alabama, would be elected president and that he would basically be be allowed back into the United States after that. Didn't really work, but he did spend the rest of his life unsuccessfully attempting to withdraw his guilty plea, secure a trial. He actually did um, escape jail at one point. 
77, June, right? 77, him and yeah. some a few other convicts escaped the uh, state penitentiary in Tennessee. They were recaptured three days later. History is complicated. The story of human progress is long, messy, and riddled with controversies big and small. On Conflicted, we dive headfirst into history's most infamous events and contentious figures. We try and untangle the good from the bad, the fact from the fiction, and the monsters from the misunderstood. Was Genghis Khan a murderous butcher or a civic pioneer? Did the Allied powers go too far in firebombing the German city of Dresden at the twilight of World War II? And how did the Marquis de Sade acquire such a sinister reputation? And was any of it true? These are just a few of the tough questions we wrestle with and investigate on Conflicted. So if you love history or just enjoy a good story, please join me, your host, Zach Cornwell, for a fascinating new topic each and every month. Conflicted, a history podcast, is available on Spotify, Apple, or wherever else you get your podcasts. I hope to see you soon. And a year was added to his sentence, so he went from 99 years to 100 years in jail. Crazy. At one point, he actually claimed that um, there was a man he met in Montreal, alias Raoul, and this Raoul was involved in, in really the conspiracy, and together with his brother, um, Johnny, was also involved. And he said that he wasn't directly involved. He, you know, there was a conspiracy here. He wasn't the only one. And he basically even said, like, he did not personally shoot King. Like, that was after he changed his, his plea. Again, evidence was presented to the House Select Committee on Assassinations, and they're like, no, dude, like uh, all the evidence points to the fact that you were the lone gunman that killed King. Yeah, that's what, um, that's what they decide anyway. Yeah. Yep. So before he dies, I mean, he dies real quick, I guess. Ray dies in prison, right? April 23rd, 1998. Uh, he's seven years old. He dies from a kidney and liver failure that's caused actually by, did you, saw, did you see this? He was apparently stabbed while he was in prison. And when he was stabbed, they gave him blood transfusions, and the blood transfusions yeah, yeah. led to like blood, hepatitis yeah, C, all these diseases and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, he was really angry. Like he, um, his brother tells what well, his brother winds up collecting his ashes, and he says, uh, "James Earl didn't want to be buried in the United States. He was so angry. He said how the government treated him. So his ashes are spread out in Ireland." Let's uh, let's let's talk about you know some of these uh, potential conspiracy theories. Well, the first one is a man by the name of uh, Lloyd Jowers, and it's basically he's an individual from Memphis. He has a lot of business interest um, right around where the assassination took place. Um, he winds up appearing on uh, Primetime Live on ABC, talking about this. He gained a lot of attention by claiming that he conspired with the mafia and the federal government to kill Martin Luther King Jr. And he said Ray was just a scapegoat. He was not directly involved in the shooting. Uh, he claimed that he'd hire someone else to kill King as a favor for a friend of the mafia. I yeah, it was apparently he hired of... a cop. I think he hired a, a yeah. police officer. So according to the Department of Justice, it's really he inconsistently identified different people as King's assassin since 1993. He kept on giving these different people. He claimed different people. He claimed the shooter was an African-American man, right? Yeah, then he um, went back to this Raul theory. Raul guy, right, yeah. who's a uh, lieutenant with the Memphis Police Department. Then he says a person he didn't even recognize was a person that did it. So the Justice Department says, like, you're not even keeping your story straight. So they couldn't, they say basically, no, you're not credible. So it'd say that the evidence alleged supporting the existence of Raul is, you know, not reliable and stuff like that. that he's, it's just all over the place. So they dismiss it. But it does lead, I guess you can talk about this, it does lead to a um, 1997, which goes even further, a court case, right? Yeah, well, because so King's son, Dexter, actually meets with Ray in jail and basically says i mean this is quote um he says it didn't i just want to ask you for the record did you kill my father and ray replied no i did not um and from that point forward you know dexter actually says i, I believe him i don't i don't believe this one guy killed my father and that's when essentially king's family urges that ray be granted a new trial right well, they know if it's a trial then they can actually bring there can be evidence going to be brought forth yeah there's a big thing when when it's but he pleaded up. guilty, he didn't have a trial. Yeah. Evidence is actually locked up now till 2027, by the way. Well, a couple of years. Yeah, right. I mean, that's five years. They should all be able to uh, 
declassify someone. They won't. They won't. No, because they're still they're still always de- um, refusing to declassify all the Kennedy assassination. Yeah, material. so they're not going to declassify an MLK either. But anyway, what happens in 1999, the family files a civil case against Jowers um, and his unnamed conspirators, um, conspirators rather, for the wrongful death of King. Um, it's the Coretta Scott King versus Lloyd Jowers. And it goes to circuit court, right, in Tennessee, um, basically through November and December of 1999. And ultimately, I mean, there's like evidence of 70 witnesses, 4,000 pages of transcripts. What came out of this? Like, based on what I was reading, the civil case said that, yes, there was a conspiracy, potentially potentially by Memphis police, federal agencies. They, They named, right, CIA, FBI, Memphis police as potential conspiracy members, but then the federal government actually throws that decision out, right? Yeah, That's but they couldn't I mean. call them as they couldn't call them as witnesses or anything like that. They yeah. just kind of say it's it was more of a piece to get it out there, a case to get it out there, and also the proof because originally it was a case for ten million dollars. Obviously, um, the guy didn't have ten million dollars, right? But they just um, then they say right, let's lower it to a hundred bucks because they're saying that it's not the money they want; it's the principle of it. So they want to prove it was a assassination a conspiracy to assassinate yeah. Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, so, the police department, Memphis Police Department, all that stuff. And the family is very outspoken about this. Yep. No, to this day. I mean, like you said, there's, day, there's yeah. a new podcast that deals with it. Um, mm-hmm. The big issue here is there is a few issues that are traditionally talked about and believed by historians. MLK, by 68, when he started concentrating on the war on poverty, he's doing something that's unprecedented that is actually almost a threat to potentially a threat to american federal government and what i'm talking about is the fact that mlk a person that was able to bring together thousands and thousands you know tens of hundreds of thousands of people for a simple cause um is now doing the same thing but he's transcending race because he's no he's longer for human rights now Exactly. He's doing it for human rights now. Yeah, yeah, he's not battling race. He's battling poverty. And he said, white brothers, black brothers, it didn't matter to him. He goes, I'm battling poverty. And he was potentially, you you know, uniting. Like, he even threatened. I mean, it's not a threat. It's probably not the right word. But, you know, he, I guess, threatened that he was going to have this humongous, the biggest march the world has ever seen on Washington, D.C. for poverty, uniting, you know, whites and blacks together and essentially asking the government to do something about it. And supposedly that made him a threat to the federal government. And Tom, the other one is what? Well, because he's out, very outspoken about the Vietnam War. Exactly. And that is something that during 1968 is, it's happening. You're having an anti-war movement with the Tet Offensive and stuff, but it, it's, it's really never validated by someone of that stature, you know? Yeah, like he's a big, a big public speaker basically coming out and saying, we shouldn't be fighting in Vietnam. Yep. You're going against, and there was a lot of people come out and saying that's unpatriotic, that's un-American. You're going against, you know, the government, and this way there's a lot of people that say, "Listen, that's the government took them out because of that." Yeah, that was the big thing. I mean, and at the end of the day, Vietnam was a, a a poor man's war. I mean, if you were in college, you weren't drafted. You know, this was a lower class of an American type of war, and a lot of people that were lower class at this time were african americans you know but he also transcended race when he spoke about vietnam he you know he said it's it's a poor man's war you know this isn't fair and again if you listen to his vietnam speech you could find those on youtube as well it's such a powerful speaker but that's pretty much what a lot of people to this day believe is the reason why the federal government has all this stuff classified because potentially they might have had something to do with his murder. Um, well, they know more than what they're telling at the very least. At That's least. a lot of people are saying. Yeah. yeah. Do you think any of that stuff will ever be released in our lifetime? Like, the, uh, you know, the MLK stuff, the JFK stuff, the RFK stuff. Like, like tell me. Like, just tell me what's up. Uh, I, I think, well, I think the main reason is there's still individuals alive. That's what the argument is, that it could impact in some way. Once, or, you know, once they're not around anymore, I think it could be more likely that something could be open. Plus, with or like the in, with just like how things kind of get leaked now, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point a lot of more information gets conveyed out there. You know, you know what gets me though? Like we say people are alive, right? But the people that were making decisions back then, I mean, this was, yeah, I guess you're right. It's 50 something years. 
And if they were probably in their 30s, they might still be alive, yeah. Yeah, they could still be alive or they could have, like, direct kin that are, you know, influenced by it in one way or the other. So for – or national security interests, that's another reason why they say they're not going to release the information. Nuts. How people are going to react. There was actually a a big – you know, movement to make MLK Jr. the create the day, Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah. Day. Pretty early on, pretty early on. Yeah, right away after, actually, after his death, um, it kind of started to talk for it, like we should make this a national holiday. But it took about 15 years to actually declare it a national holiday. And it went through a lot to get this done. You know, because Reagan, was, actually dies, right? Reagan does it. Yep. There was a lot of pushback. 83. Yeah, there's a lot of pushback from some southern states and southern politicians about making this a a holiday. Um, And they even try to, in Congress, they try to introduce, because the bill is being introduced again and again and again, uh, and there's sponsors for it all the way along. And then some people are trying to introduce some incriminating evidence about King that was collected by the FBI to kind of smear his personality. And that's being, you know, that's being brought into Congress, like we shouldn't have a day for this person. And that's ignored for a while. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, as well. And then 80s is when it really starts to turn towards this. Uh, you have CBC collected like 6 million signatures um, to support a federal holiday in honor of King. Stevie Wonder wrote a song, Happy Birthday, about King, right? Um, which also brought up a huge public support for the holiday. Then in 83, a civil rights movement veterans uh, gathered in Washington, commemorated the 20th anniversary of March in Washington. Um, and I have a dream speech. Things started to really look up for it, and eventually it's brought into um, Congress. The bill passes 78 to 22, and President Ronald Reagan signs the legislation. However, some people uh, or some states in the South actually, you know, first of all, it took years to even observe it. But I don't know if you saw this, but several southern states promptly combined MLK Day um, with holidays that uplifted Confederate leader Robert E. Lee, who was born on January 19th. Yeah, I didn't see that. That's just, I mean, yeah. Nuts, nuts. I yeah. just, I can't. And then Arizona initially observed the holiday, then rescinded it. And then there was like a whole years long scuffle, whether they should celebrate it. And finally started celebrating again um, in 1992. It actually wasn't until 2000 that officially every state in the union observed MLK Day. Yeah, which is nuts. nuts. Yeah, people wouldn't really know that you know yeah you know they, they right i mean our, our students wouldn't know um because you know there were most of them were born after two like all of them were born after 2000 oh yeah damn we're all tom anyway that's well that's why we're here to talk a little bit about history so they could listen yeah, talking about history exactly that's right why not but anyway um enough, do, you, do you have enough. anything else i mean no i think that we pretty much summed everything up you know it was one of these events that you know rocked the cut and rocked the nation um and it's one of those things that one of those I think brings in one of those what if questions of history. You know, like if Martin Luther King wasn't, what if he didn't wasn't assassinated? What if he survived the assassination? How differently things could have been? Like what would have happened? You know, it just would have been different than how it played out, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. There was another piece have of to- legislation that was passed because of his assassination. I forgot what it was. It was something with housing. There was the I forgot the proper name, but it was about how no discrimination in housing based on race, sex, religion. Um, it was considered the last civil rights act to be passed. Uh, it was sixty eight. Sixty eight. Something housing. And you, act. And again, when you keep on looking back at sixty eight, just how like crazy sixty eight was, you know. For those of you guys that are curious, listen to our nineteen sixty eight podcast. Yes, yes, nice little plug there, but yeah, um, you know, it's it was a you know Somewhere just there. a whacked out year in american history nuts well anyway guys thank you so much um hopefully we'll return with something happier next week um yeah we're gonna have to do a happy one we did yeah, a this couple was a sad one tough ones yeah um anyway guys thank you so much for listening we greatly appreciate it and if you need to find us or email us please feel free we get emails all the time thank you for those of you guys that do email us you can reach us at www.historyteacherstalkingpodcast.com we are there if you need us. We could also, you can find us on social media all over the place. Just kind of, you know, search for history teachers talking. And I guess that's it. So uh, click subscribe wherever you are listening to this and enjoy the rest of your week. See you guys. Stay safe, everybody.
hope everyone enjoyed our podcast. And if you would like to email us, you can do so at historyteacherspodcast at gmail.com. History is the greatest adventure story. But does it ever leave you wondering what the women were doing all that time? This is Lori from the Her Half of History podcast. And the answer is that some women were seizing power or escaping slavery or spying for their country or creating artistic masterpieces while countless others were doing the laundry, getting married and wondering why their clothes don't have more pockets. If you would like to hear the stories of women doing all of those things, check out Her Half of History at herhalfofhistory.com or wherever you get your podcasts.